I'm Dirk Chatlin. Uh, I have been a sports writer at the Omaha World Herald for 15 years, and I'm a lifelong Nebraskan. I grew up uh, born and raised in Rising City, Nebraska, which few people have been to or uh, through. We just got a new gas station, uh, so that's exciting. But uh, my parents are still there, and that's about an hour from Lincoln, and I went to school at Columbus High School, and I came to college here at the university where I fell in love with journalism. I uh, was, was a four-year student at the uh, College of Journalism in Mass Communications, and then I went to the World Herald from there. So I haven't had as many twists and turns as, as some people, and I, I realized that my boring biography is perhaps a hindrance in my writing, uh, you know, in my ability to, to sort of capture everybody's experience, but I, I definitely know a lot about Nebraska and, and North Omaha is, is a big part of that. Well, that's a great question, and I, uh, I'm probably not as well versed in the great writers of Nebraska history as I should have been growing up, uh, but I was very much, I think, shaped either consciously or subconsciously by, by the setting, and I have consistently been drawn to uh, rural Nebraska in the things that I've written about over the last 15 years. Uh, a few years back I went and, and did a story about a, a six-man football team in a very small town that was, uh, that was driving all over the state in search of six-man football games and in one day they went they drove all the way out to the Panhandle 370 miles one way 370 miles back the other way uh, to play to play six-man football and so I'm just I, I've been consistently drawn back to kind of where I came from uh, in places like Rising City the uh, the the places you know are a little bit different than where I am now I mean obviously I'm working in Omaha and writing about North Omaha and so I think in some ways that has been advantageous because uh, going into a new environment I've been able to sort of see it with with fresh eyes so I saw a story um, in North Omaha that I think a lot of people who grew up in Omaha hadn't seen because it was it was a little bit more normal to them. So, you know, Nebraska is a very interesting place because there's a there's a, a distinct rural and distinct urban, and I've kind of bounced back and forth in the things that I've written about. I was very blessed. Uh, at the University of Nebraska to be there at a time when there were some really talented writers uh, my age and at the Daily Nebraskan specifically. So it was sort of the heyday of the DN, at least I, I like to think so. And so I, I had some friendships that uh, people that really pushed me and we bounced ideas off of each other a lot. Matthew Hansen is a great example. He was a, a World Herald and Journal Star uh, reporter for a long time. And, uh, but probably the biggest influence was, was a journal, journalism professor named Joe Starita, who is a, a great Nebraska author, uh, very interested in, in Native American issues and, and Native American characters throughout history. And uh, so he's probably the one who kind of pushed me the most and sort of made me appreciate uh, the value in not only uh, great stories, but also just the, the the fine details of great stories, down to down to each sentence and each word and things that I'd never thought about before. I don't know if I am a writer uh, still, but, but you, you kind of fake it, I think, as long as possible. But writers always have this uh, sort sort of this this pendulum swinging back and forth between. Uh, confidence and you know ego versus on the other hand insecurity and uh, feeling like you're completely you know over your head and I certainly swing back and forth like most writers do but uh, but I think I've gotten more confident over time at the Omaha World Herald they've given me a lot of freedom and independence to to sort of spread my wings a little bit and about a year ago uh, a year and a half ago as I started messing around with this project about North Omaha, some people in the newsroom got really excited and they, they recognized it as, as something that one, we'd, we'd never really tackled before, uh, and two, we did it in a way that was, that was pretty unique through sports. So uh, I think here, you know, in the last year, I've, I've recognized that, that with, with a lot of help, uh, I, can, I can tackle a really big story.
Well, I, I was I fell in love with sports a lot bef a long time before I fell in love with writing, and so so initially I was drawn to, um, you know. Thursday, Thursday afternoon, coming home from school and, and running to the mailbox because Sports Illustrated came on Thursday afternoons, uh, and a lot of people can relate to that. I was uh, I was addicted to the Omaha World Herald uh, and and would go straight to the sports page. Um, when I was young, I still remember, probably nine or ten years old, sort of writing my first sports sports columns or sports stories uh, just for class or after school. Uh, just kind of playing around with big sporting events, and I remember writing about the the uh, 1989 World Series earthquake, and uh, sort of almost imagining that I'm a sports writer writing about that. And I would cringe to go back and read that stuff now. Uh, hopefully, I don't have any of it. But it, it's sort of uh, sports was kind of my entry into it. And as I as I've gone along, I think I've I've become much more a fan of of writing. Uh, than sports writing. I can appreciate um, writing outside of the realm of sports and hopefully I've become a little bit more diverse in what I've been able to do over the years. Sports was, was sort of my, um, was kind of the lens that I saw the story through. And when I, when I was growing up, you know, I was aware of Bob Gibson and Johnny Rogers and, and Gail Sayers and some of these big names, but I was too young to see any of those athletes. And so you sort of, you're kind of aware of what they did. And then I got to the World Herald in 2005 and gained a little bit more appreciation for who they were and what they accomplished. Uh, but it wasn't until 2006, 2008, kind of in that range, that I, that I understood it as much more than a sports story. It was really a story about a place. It was a story about a neighborhood in Omaha and how a neighborhood produced all these incredible people at the same time. And I think once I, once I discovered that part of it, that it wasn't really a sports story, we could sort of attract people. The way that I like to describe it is, you know, it's, it's like when you have to give your dog, uh, you know, a, his pill or, or his medicine and you, you put it in a biscuit or a cookie. And you know, sports is sort of the is sort of the biscuit or the cookie in this case. But the the real you know core of the story is what happened to North Omaha 50 years ago in the course of the civil rights movement and how it was this place of, of tremendous triumph but also tremendous tragedy. And I think once I started to understand that it was it was much bigger than a sports story, then that's when I realized. Uh, we've got to find a way to do this, and then it only took me nine years after that to actually get it done. My process is ever evolving uh, and usually failing. And uh, like most writers, I think I'm I'm sort of terrified by the by the blank screen or the white page, and will do anything to find a source of inspiration. Usually, that will come at night rather than in the morning. Uh, but I think what I've learned most is when you, when you are starting to feel a little bit of creativity or inspiration, just keep going because uh, it, it disappears pretty quickly. And I think it's important that when you have something to say, uh, just continue to tap that vein. Most of the sources were native Omahans, I would say between the ages of 65 and 85, uh, people who grew up and lived in the in the heyday of North Omaha during the Civil Rights era. Uh, but the other the other half was a lot of archival research, uh, including in libraries all over the all over Omaha and Lincoln, um, looking for archival material. Sometimes it would be you know when Jackie Robinson came to Omaha in 1946, or when you know Ray Charles or uh, you know, Jesse Owens or, or people like that when they would come to Omaha. But in other cases, it was trying to find, you know, a little bit more context for when memories get fuzzy. So, you know, I think like a, like a lot of people, it's, it's really difficult for, for Marlon Briscoe and people like that to remember what it was like in 1963 or 1968. So that was where the, the old newspaper stories and the archival stuff really came in handy because it sort of completed the picture that was, um, you know, these guys would, would sort of introduce the concept or, or 
explain what they could about a situation and then you kind of had to fill in the gaps and, and that was where the old newspaper stuff came in really handy but but most of this came from probably 60 to 70 extensive interviews with with men and women who who lived in North Omaha well the I, I think arguably the best part of this book is is the photos that we discovered because they're just, I mean, I think that the traditional way to have done this book would have been sort of, you know, page after page of, of print, and that's okay, but the World Herald has this treasure trove of, of photo archives that goes all the way back to, I mean, almost 100 years in some cases. And so to go back and, and pull, you know, what Gail Sayers was, looked like the day that he, uh, broke the Nebraska long jump record or to, to go back and tap the, the George Wallace visit to the Civic Auditorium in March of 1968 and all the protests and the, the riots that came out of that. I mean, the World Herald archives are just incredible. I think they're one of the best history resources in the entire state. So that was really an important part of this project was I can, I can sort of paint a picture about some of these things, but, but the photos do a much better job. It's a very good question, and I think typically I write for myself. Uh, I find that if I'm really interested in something, if I'm very passionate about it, if I'm doing my job, I can persuade others to care about it as much as I do. And so rather than wondering, is this going to be boring to someone, uh, I generally try to satisfy my own curiosity. And of course there's going to be editing and there's going to be you know, making something more concise, but, but typically if I'm going down a rabbit hole, uh, I'm trusting the reader will go with me eventually. And I think that's, that's there's a lot of that in this book where, you know, I, I went really deep, for instance, into uh, in, to Nebraska's open housing debates in the 1960s and that came through the legislature. Should, uh, should homeowners and, and renters uh, have the authority to discriminate based on race? And I was, you know, deep in the in the old legislature debates, uh, and in some ways I was worried: Are people going to stick with this? But on the other hand, I, I sort of trusted that okay, if I if I tell the story properly, you know, people will care as much about this as I do. One of the toughest things about this story, from my perspective, is people see pieces of it that I don't even see. Uh, and so when, when I think about, okay, what are the lessons of this thing, oftentimes somebody will send me an email and, and say something that I, I didn't consider. You know, they'll, they'll talk about the power of X or Y and how this is a, an example of where society failed or succeeded in this regard. But the things that really jump out to me are, are one, the power of community. And I think that, you know, this is an example of, of, again, basically one square mile, one small neighborhood in the middle of the country that, that produced greatness uh, because they came together and, you know, they, they raised each other's kids, they, uh, they sacrificed for each other. And I think there's a real lesson in that, especially now, and I, exp I feel it in my everyday life where it's very easy to get um, sort of self-absorbed either in your own actions or in your family's actions to where you know you don't you're, you're not paying as much attention or caring as much about your neighbors and your uh, the people in other parts of the city and I think it's really important to, to maintain uh, a community uh, you know sort of a care for community that that I think in some ways has been lost because of technology and sort of the silos that we live in uh, we're all staring down at our phones all the time instead of wondering how we can help our neighbors and I think this this book is a really good lesson uh, in the value of that. There were a lot of obstacles. Um, I think one for for much of the reporting process most of the main, main characters were not uh, available for whatever reason. I mean, Bob Boozer, I spoke to him in 2008, but he passed away in 2012. Um, you know, Bob Gibson is sort of famously 
hard to reach for for media. Uh, Gail Sayers is, is suffered from dementia and isn't really available for for interviews. Uh, Ernie Chambers, again, like Gibson, is sort of famously difficult uh, to to sit down in front of and and get him for 90 minutes or however long it would take. So I think one of the challenges was just the availability of main sources. The other thing is cultural because I'm, again, I'm the one or two generations after these guys. And, you know, I can only imagine their skepticism when a World Herald reporter at 30 or 35 years old, and by the way, the World Herald has not always been fair to North Omaha, uh, and that reputation is, is pretty well known in, in North Omaha. So, you know, when a World Herald reporter calls and says, hey, I want to ask you about what happened in the 1960s in your neighborhood, I think that was a real challenge. And, and I think hopefully I overcame that in part just because my curiosity is, is genuine and I tried to be sincere. Uh, I tried to listen as well as possible, and I think that's one of the most important things. When you're really passionate about an issue, uh, walk into it with, with genuine curiosity, because I think usually if people, uh, if people recognize that you truly care about their story and their life, they will, they will open up, they will talk, uh, but it does require some, some diligence, and I eventually got Bob Gibson, I eventually got Ernie Chambers, uh, I eventually got almost everybody in the story who was alive, but, uh, but it, took some, it took some work. Well, Ernie Chambers is, was pretty <laughs> skeptical of this thing for you know, pretty obvious reasons, and he, he read, we, we had a, a discussion, it would have been probably a couple weeks before these chapters started coming out in the newspaper. And he said he didn't want to be part of it. He, I showed him, I eventually showed him the, uh, some of the art for it and the sketches and, and he's an artist and, and really admired the sort of the artwork that we were using for the project. But he, he didn't necessarily want to be a source or want to be part of it and I respected that. But after four or five chapters ran in the newspaper, he called me on the phone, and I was driving uh, out to my hometown with my kids, and and he said uh, he he was he was very appreciative of, of what had been in the paper, and he uh, sort of I, he'd come around a little bit, and he said uh, he said Have you ever taken a genealogy test? And I said I said No. He said Well, don't do it. And I said, well, why? And he said, because you might find that you and I are brothers from another mother. And so, you know, Ernie Chambers, uh, if we could get him to, to respect what we were doing, that meant a lot because he's, uh, you know, for good reason. I mean, he lived this stuff and he, he has vivid memories of what happened. And I think uh, for him to, to appreciate how we recounted it really meant a lot. We've been really fortunate that we have, I mean, I hate to say unanimous because nothing is ever unanimous, but it's, yeah. it's almost unanimous uh, support and endorsement from, from the people in the book. And that includes Johnny Rogers, Roger Sayers, Gail Sayers, his wife, uh, even Bob Gibson, because Bob Gibson, after two chapters ran in the paper, he, uh, I'd been trying to reach him, I wrote him a letter this was right about the time that he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he called and, and we had a nice 45 minute discussion uh, where, and, and Bob Gibson has actually helped us sort of get the word out. He's got a lot of contacts in the baseball community. So he was reaching out to Joe Torrey and Bob Costas and Tim McCarver and people like that and telling them about the book. And so it's been, we've been really, really fortunate. Every time we've had an event or uh, you know, a, a book presentation uh, or a panel discussion or whatever, people like Johnny Rogers have been so giving of their time to be part of it. And, and I, re I so appreciate that because it wouldn't have to be that way. Uh, they could look at this and say, you know, this, this is either old news or it doesn't represent my views or whatever. And we've just been so fortunate that, that people in North Omaha, the people who really lived it, uh, have endorsed the book. Well, I think the 
the cultural obstacle was real um, because again, I'm, I'm 40, 45 years younger than a lot of these characters in the book. And I think in some ways they probably looked at me and said, what does this guy know? Why would we trust this guy with our story? Uh, and, and I totally understand that. The, the fact that I kept coming back to them and really showed a, a genuine curiosity in their, in their story and, and probably also described to them why I thought it was important to, to tell the full story of North Omaha. I mean, this is sort of a history of North Omaha. And I think they appreciated the fact that that was a story that had been, that had been untold uh, and needed to be told. It was an advantage in certain ways, though, because I think, uh, for one, I could come into it fresh with, with limited... Um, you know, limited biases or, or, you know, I think in some ways you're, you are um, probably handicapped a little bit sometimes when you have a lot of information you're coming into a story with. Sometimes it's, it's good to come in a little bit more fresh, and I, and I was probably able to do that. And then I think it has helped in, in getting the book out or the story out because people um, probably recognize that this is not an advocacy book. I mean, this is, when it's written by an outsider, I think sometimes it helps the credibility, uh, where if it's written by someone who, you know, is a cousin of somebody or grew up in that community, people look at it as, as more of a, as an advocacy book. And th that's not really the case here. I mean, I, I think coming into it fresh from the outside helped a little bit in terms of credibility. Well, I think it's very relevant. You know, I think a lot of the issues that North Omaha struggled with in the 50s and 60s are still, still right on the front burner today. And I'm amazed at how many times I've heard that in reporting the story, where whether it's voting rights or redlining or any number of issues, where people that I talk to in the story say, and this has not changed. This is the same as it was 50 years ago. And in some ways, it's, it's even more devastating because it means that a lot of those things haven't changed in that amount of time. So uh, I think especially in this political environment where a lot of these racial issues continue to, to sort of uh, bubble up, uh, you know, it's, it's a really important story. And I always believe that, you know, I did a podcast for the World Herald for a couple of years called Where I Come From, and I really believe that, that it's important to, to understand someone's background to really understand who they are today. And the same is true of a neighborhood and a city, and I think it's, it's just critical that, that Nebraska and Omaha uh, understand what happened 50 years ago in that part of the city to, to sort of understand how to fix those issues still today. Good afternoon and welcome to the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors at Bennett Martin Public Library. My name's Diane Wilson and I'm curator of our collection here. The Heritage Room has a unique uh, status here at Lincoln City Libraries. It's funded by an endowment that is supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association and that was established through the Foundation for Lincoln City Libraries. Through membership, programming, and fundraising efforts, um, the NLHA makes events like this possible. So for those members of NLHA that are here today, I want to thank you for your support. The mission of the Heritage Room is to preserve and promote literature by and about Nebraska authors. One way we do that is by um, providing the John A. James Reading Series as a venue for authors to share their books, which then enables our community of readers, which is you, to learn about the great literary talent here in our state. So today is the 222nd Ames reading that we've had since we started in 1985. Today we're pleased to host Dirk Chatlin, um, who is a lifelong Nebraskan. Dirk is a native of Rising City, and he graduated from Columbus High School and also the University of Nebraska at Lincoln College of Journalism. Dirk now resides in Gretna with his wife and kids, and uh, he's a 15-year veteran of the Omaha World Herald and a five-time Nebraska Sports Writer of the Year. 
24th and Glory is his first book project. So uh, thank Dirk for joining us and welcome him, please. Thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's the nicest day that we'll have all winter, so I want to I be respectful of your time and, and thank you especially for coming out on, on such a beautiful day. Um, when people say what, when people wonder what this, this project is about, uh, I try to sort of encapsulate it into a soundbite. And that soundbite would, would go something like this. Imagine a moment in time when the greatest baseball player in the world is from Omaha, Nebraska. The greatest football player in the world is from Omaha, Nebraska. One of the 10 best players in the NBA, professional basketball, is from Omaha, Nebraska. The best rookie player in professional basketball is from Omaha. The, uh, the, first, uh, the first black man in America to start a professional football game at quarterback is from Omaha, Nebraska. A future Heisman Trophy winner is playing football on Friday nights. He's obviously from Omaha, Nebraska. This all happened at the exact same time, and not just the same time any time, but uh, the fall of 1968 which you don't have to be a professional historian to recognize uh, is one of the most t contentious and tumultuous times in, in American history, uh, especially racially. And not just any part of Omaha, Nebraska, uh, but a small one square mile section of the city uh, just north of downtown, the near north side, where all of these men were African American men coming from the same neighborhood uh, in, the, in the fall of 1968, they all rose to world prominence in sports at a time when the neighborhood that they came from, the, uh, the, the sort of this, this wonderful place that they came from, was collapsing and uh, ensuring that there would not be a next generation of great athletes from North Omaha. So I... I sort of knew about this story um, all the way back in 2006, 2008, and yet I wasn't sure that I could tackle it. It just felt too big and too nuanced, uh, and certainly there were some cultural obstacles facing a 25, 26-year-old kid from Rising City, Nebraska, but I was obsessed with it at the same time. And uh, I was especially obsessed with, with one date that I couldn't get out of my mind. And it was October 6, 1968. On October 6, 1968, a Sunday afternoon, pretty similar to this, in a span of about two hours, Bob Gibson won his seventh consecutive World Series start. That was a Major League Baseball record. Gail Sayers rushed for 100 yards against the Baltimore Colts, including a 60-yard touchdown run that he called the best run of his, of his career. And Marlon Briscoe became uh, the first black quarterback to start a professional football game. He broke the color barrier at the most prestigious position in sports. This all happened in a span of two hours on a Sunday afternoon. Three guys, three black guys from North Omaha, Nebraska. And I just had this date etched in my brain. And for nine years, uh, I sort of just couldn't get it out of my head. I did most of the inter interviews for this story way back in 2006, 2007, 2008. And then I just kind of let it sit there in my house. It was in a tub and it moved houses with me. And I got married and I had kids and I lost hair and I lost more hair. And I kept walking by this tub and it just gnawed at me because I knew that it was the best untold Nebraska story that I'd ever heard. And yet again, I didn't know if I could handle it. I didn't know if I could do it justice. But I had encouragers, and one of the biggest encouragers, uh, and this goes all the way back to when I started the reporting process, was, was a, an African-American man named Rodney Weed. Rodney Weed is sort of my, he's like my Forrest Gump in this book, okay? He's all over the place. Uh, he's, he's got connections to Malcolm X, to Bob Gibson, to Martin Luther King Jr., to George Wallace in 1968. Rodney Weed saw it all. And Rodney Weed is the one who introduced me to the true North Omaha way back in 2006 when I got interested in this project. And what I knew of North Omaha as someone born in 1981 uh, was 
essentially, you know, I'm from Rising City, which is an hour northwest of here. It is ironically named neither Rising nor a city, population 392 people, okay? My understanding of North Omaha was this is where the riots happened in the 60s. This is where the lots are abandoned and the windows are, uh, are boarded up. And this is a place you don't go after dark. And 24th and Lake Street was the epicenter of chaos in the 1960s. That was my understanding. Rodney Weed is the man who said, basically shook me. He's about six foot six and a very intimidating presence, but also, also a wonderful heart. And he, he was very patient and essentially said, no, you got it all wrong. Everybody's got it all wrong. North Omaha was not a place uh, that should be remembered like that. North Omaha was the most vibrant, cohesive, dense place in the entire city of Omaha and thus the entire state. It was this incredible pocket of black culture, uh, like a little piece of the South transported into the middle of the country where most people on the coast didn't even realize that African Americans existed. Uh, this was a place where there were businesses all up and down North 24th Street, where there were, you, if you walk down that street on a Friday or Saturday night, you could stumble into celebrities like Ray Charles or Jackie Robinson or uh, the Negro League buses that came up from Kansas City, Satchel Page, and I didn't know any of this stuff. Rodney said, you know, he, he says, start counting the businesses. Look at, look at what it was like back then. And so I go back to the city directories, and sure enough, in the 1950s, there's 170 businesses from Cumming Street to basically Lake Street, once one mile on North 24th Street. And I didn't know any of this stuff. And Rodney said, okay, to really get a picture of it, to really understand what it was like, you got to go all the way back to get the full picture. You got to go all the way back to the Great Migration. Got to go back to World War I, the 19, 19 teens, 1916, 17, 18, 19. That's when black families uh, all across the South departed these little towns in Alabama and Mississippi and, and Georgia and came north to cities like Pittsburgh and Kansas City and Cleveland and Chicago. And they came to Omaha. Why did they come to Omaha? Because we had dead cattle. We had lots of dead cattle. The uh, South Omaha packing houses. Uh, were flourishing at that point. The stockyards were booming. This is L Street in the in the 20s, 30s, and 40s when uh, cattle trucks would line up on L Street for two or three miles all the way back with farmers and ranchers trying to get their uh, their cattle and hogs to market. And these packing houses where the real gory gruesome work was done, they needed workers. And to get workers to, to butcher these cattle uh, to work the, the hide cellars in the basement and the kill floors on top, they needed hard manual labor. And to do that, they went down and they recruited Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma. It's amazing. It's almost uh, comical how the main characters in this story, whether it's Bob Gibson, Bob Boozer, Gail Sayers, Marlon Briscoe, Ernie Chambers, their families all originated in the South. And they all came north, they all migrated north, because of the Omaha stockyards and because of those dead cattle. And what they walked into in the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s was, uh, was first of all, this incredible, this incredible environment in South Omaha where it was diverse and it was, it was gritty uh, and it was a place where, as one person put in the book, you walked into your packing house job at 7 o'clock in the morning feeling like a 26-year-old man and you walked out at 4 o'clock in the afternoon feeling like you were 40, okay? You could smell this, you could smell the cattle five, six miles away all the way in North Omaha and when these guys would come home from work, they'd carry the blood with them, they'd walk in the house, they would uh, shed their, their overalls and their clothes, they'd go immediately to the bath to, to wash the blood off of their, off of their bodies. And so in this place, uh, in this North Omaha neighborhood, you had this incredible work ethic that filtered down from these guys that worked the packing houses. And it filtered down to men like Bob Gibson and Bob Boozer and Gail Sayers, and they saw what, what work ethic was like. They also saw what unity was like, because in this neighborhood, in this one square mile in North Omaha, what you had was an incredible uh, sense of unity and purpose and a little motivation to go with it. 
because this is a piece of the city that is hard lined segregated okay when these families came north they might have been expecting something different than alabama and mississippi they got exactly what they had in alabama and mississippi and what did that look like in north omaha it meant that you couldn't go to the downtown movie theater without being sent up into the balcony it meant that you couldn't go to restaurants you'd be turned away if you were african-american it meant if you were bob boozer in the early 50s that when you and your buddies went down to the downtown YMCA to the swimming pool for the one time, one day a week that you could swim in the downtown pool, they drained the pool when you left. Okay, North Omaha, if you were African American, you knew where you stood and you knew the places you could and couldn't go. But out of that environment, um, I should say one aside here, and, and that is your fear in doing a project like this is that you will discover incredible things after publication okay so that somebody will email in or call in a story and one of those incredible stories came just in the last couple of weeks when i got an email from from a from a great omaha woman who knows her history who said that in 1961 some of you are old enough to remember this uh in 1961 the missouri valley tennis association held its its championships in Omaha. And for two weeks, the greatest tennis players in the, in the Midwest descended on Omaha to play tennis. And this is, you know, there's dozens of competitions like this around the country. But this one was a little bit unique because it had sort of a phenom tennis player uh, among, among the competitors. And on one of the off days, uh, all the tennis players in the competition went out to Peeney Park to uh, to take in some recreation, to swim in the Peeney Park pool. Peeney Park until 1963 was segregated. Okay, so, so blacks could not especially swim at Peeney Park until the summer of 63, and this is 61. So there's two buses that go out to Peeney Park. The first one is allowed in, the second one is turned away. Who's on the second one? An 18-year-old tennis player named Arthur Ashe. And I read that and I just about started crying because it's like, Sadly, that's not in the book in front of you, uh, but it will be in the fourth edition, I promise. So um, this is North Omaha in, in, in the 1950s. And out of, this, out of this environment, out of this vibrant, cohesive, dense place uh, where kids grow up with an incredible work ethic and knowing exactly where they stand in the greater context of their community, out of that generation comes the greatest athletes our state has ever seen. How does that happen? We need a spark, okay? We need someone to take this environment and, uh, and sort of push it. And that spark comes, uh, comes from a World War II veteran who comes home from India in 1945, and he is an educated man. He is a competitive man. He was, he's a Tech High graduate from 1939. He worked the packing houses before he went to World War II. Uh, he comes home, he gets his, his bachelor's degree in teaching from Omaha University. He gets a master's degree from Creighton in 1950. You can count on one hand the, the number of African Americans getting a master's degree from Creighton in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, but this man uh, comes home and uh, basically wants to be a high school teacher and coach, okay? He should have been a high school teacher and coach based on his experience, and yet OPS would not hire black teachers and coaches until 1963, just like Penny Park. Uh, so this man named Josh Gibson, Josh Gibson uh, does something pretty extraordinary in hindsight. It might have been ordinary at the time, but, but uh, 60, 70 years later, it really stands out. He grabs a shovel, and he goes over to the schoolyard at Kellum Schoolyard, and he builds up a pitcher's mound in the back of Kellum School. Josh Gibson does this because he loves sports. He does this because he's looking for a mission uh, and a purpose in his community. He also does this because he has an 11-year-old uh, brother who's just kind of off the rails. Okay, This little 11-year-old brother, you might recognize his name, Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson is 11 years old, and he's just getting in trouble all over the neighborhood. Okay, he's pulling the back of the streetcar brake, uh, and and getting swatted right there on 24th Street by his mother. He's uh, stealing pastries out of a Jewish bakery window on on 24th and Lake. 
His, uh, his teachers send notes home that never get to his mother because he rips them up. He's just kind of a mess, okay? And Josh Gibson, his older brother, 15 years older, recognizes that Bob needs something to do. He needs a purpose. And so in the spring of 1947, Josh Gibson, in this uh, self-made pitcher's mound in the back of Kellum School, he takes his brother over there, and they play catch back and forth most of that year, to the point where people around them, Bob Boozer included, still remember what that sounded like, those two playing catch in the back of Kellum School, that pop, 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 pop. Okay, Josh Gibson is doing this because uh, he loves his brother and he's trying to give him a purpose, but he's also doing this because there's something happening in America, in black America, in the spring of 1947 that is inspiring him. Spring of 1947, what's going on in the sports world at that time that might have lit a fire under Josh Gibson? Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson is a rookie, uh, a rookie with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he's making his breakthrough. And at some point, there has to be, uh, there has to be a moment in Josh Gibson's mind where he sees what Jackie Robinson is and what Bob Gibson could be, and he draws that line between them. And I wish, I wish uh, he would have lived long enough for me to ask him in person. But it's, it's pretty extraordinary what he does. And it's extraordinary what happens 21 years later when Bob Gibson, on October 6, 1968, at Tiger Stadium, is winning his seventh consecutive start in the World Series. And who's sitting in the front row? Jackie Robinson. Okay, So there's some incredible symmetry in this story. But Josh doesn't just stop there with playing catch with his kid brother in the back of, of the schoolyard. He, he, he recognizes that there's a lot of kids like Bob Gibson. There's a lot of kids who need something to do in the neighborhood. So he builds it, he creates a baseball team, okay? The North Omaha Monarchs, the North Omaha, North, uh, North Omaha YMCA Monarchs, named after the Negro League team in Kansas City. And he takes them over to Burdett Field, and he sort of turns them into the bad new, from the Bad News Bears into a real baseball team. He's, uh, you know, hitting ground balls through the, through the rocky infield, and he's hitting fly balls with the fungo bat, and he's, he's turning these kids into something. He's also sort of inspiring them educationally. Because Rodney Weed, uh, that man who, who sort of unveiled this world to me, uh, Rodney Weed would show up at practice. He's Bob Gibson's best friend. And he would see Josh Gibson walking over from Creighton University with a stack of books under his arm because he's in the master's, the master's program at Creighton. And he starts asking Josh questions. And Josh kind of describes to him the, the value of education. And he's introducing you know, lessons that, that Rodney Weed wouldn't have got anywhere else. And 70 years later, Rodney Weed is an 84-year-old uh, black history professor in St. Louis, Missouri. He had a stroke a year ago, and he's right back on the horse teaching black history uh, to, to students in St. Louis, Missouri. So Josh is not only teaching these kids baseball, but he's also teaching them education. And one of the most important parts that he can teach them educationally is he can get them out of North Omaha. He can sort of broaden their horizons and show them a world that they don't see in the Logan Fontenelle projects where they're living. And what he does is, again, pretty extraordinary in hindsight, Josh Gibson starts putting ads in the newspaper. If you want to play my team, the North Omaha YMCA Monarchs, give me a call at 402 whatever. And he gets some, you know, he gets some phone calls from Dundee and Florence and Benson and places like that. But he gets more phone calls from places out in the country, from Woodbine, Iowa, and Avoca, Iowa, Red Oak, and little towns in northeast Nebraska. And so Josh does something, you know, he doesn't have any money for, for uh, uniforms. He doesn't really have any transportation, but he finds a way. He starts asking around, and he gets, uh, you know, he gets. Preston loves orchestra bus, uh, and he loads them in there. Or he finds an old U-Haul or an old army truck with the canvas on the back. He puts 11 or 12-year-old little black kids from the projects and takes them out into the country, into these little towns in Iowa, where they play these little league games. And imagine, you know, what it's like to be a 12-year-old who's never been outside of North Omaha. Uh, suddenly driving out into the countryside. It was a pretty eye-opening experience. So eye-opening, in fact, that they, that they nicknamed one of the kids on the team Corn because he just couldn't stop looking at the corn, you know, back and forth. <laughs> Imagine also what it was like to be a 12-year-old white kid in one of those little towns in Iowa 
where you've never uh, you've never had your horizons broaden very much either. And here comes on a on a summer night the uh, you know a U-Haul or or Preston Love's old orchestra bus, and out of it jumps a dozen black kids from the projects. Uh, that had to be an eye-opening experience in 1947, also. So. You know, Josh, he could have just left it there, but he had, if you know anything about the Gibson DNA, you know that there is a tenacity uh, that, that bonds these guys. And if it, it, Bob had it when he was a pitcher, and Josh certainly had it as a coach, to the point that Josh, uh, he would consistently storm out of that dugout when an umpire. Uh, tried to cheat him or didn't give him a call or something like that. And every time he did it, you know, his players would be in the dugout and their heads would drop and, oh, my gosh, Josh is going to get us all killed or run out of this town because he's arguing with another umpire. There was an umpire, and I think it was Red Oak, Iowa, who, uh, who his chest protector was a baby mattress. And he was an old sheriff, and he kept a gun in his holster uh, while he was behind the plate. And he had this terrible stutter where the ball would cross home plate and he'd say, boo, 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 strike! <laughs> and Josh got so fed up and he'd storm out of the dugout and he did that all the time. I mean, he, w he didn't mind his team losing, but he wasn't going to be cheated. And Josh just had this drive, okay? And he would sometimes he'd pull his kids off the team and off the field entirely because he felt like they were being cheated. He would boycott games if he felt like he would be cheated. Josh just, uh, he had a chip on his shoulder, and it, it stuck with him and his kid brother their entire lives. So Josh takes this team uh, down to, from these little towns in, in Iowa, he takes them down to Kansas City, where they get to play in the, at the home of the, uh, the Kansas City Monarchs, the Negro League team. He thought that they were going to be able to stay at the YMCA in beds. Uh, they wouldn't let them, they didn't have accommodations. The kids had to sleep on pool tables down there. Uh, but they made it all the way in the in the summer of 1950. They made it all the way to the Midget League State Championships in Wayne, Nebraska. And the, the bus broke down on the way there, but they made it, and they won three games in three days, and they became the first North Omaha team to win a state championship in baseball in the Midget Leagues. Bob Gibson would win a lot more championships in the next 20 years, but that was his first one. So... Josh could have stopped there, right? He he could have built a little uh, a little bad news Bears team that that won a couple state championships, and then he could have, you know, escorted his kid brother on to greatness at Creighton University and the St. Louis Cardinals. But again, that wasn't his personality. He didn't stop there. He came home, and if OPS wasn't going to hire him to teach PE and coach, he was essentially going to turn the entire North Omaha neighborhood into his personal PE class. And so he starts programs through the YMCA and the city rec department. He starts programs in volleyball, badminton, wheelchair basketball, ping pong, all sorts of things. And he's getting hundreds of kids active uh, in sports in sort of progressive ways, not just through, uh, not just all young boys. I mean, there's a little girl, a teenage girl at Tech High named Maggie King, who almost makes the Olympics because Josh helps her. Uh, in high jump, this is the days when, when you would jump over the bar uh, almost the way you would as a hurdler. And Maggie King, this 14-year-old girl from the Logan Fontenelle Projects, almost makes the Olympics in 1954 uh, with Josh's help. So it's pretty extraordinary what he's doing from a sports standpoint. Omaha is really, North Omaha has really taken off uh, athletically. At the same time, and this is where we, we kind of discover a theme in this story, uh, there's kind of two currents in this story. There's an athletic current and there's a civil rights current. And they're both moving pretty quickly in North Omaha at the same time in the 50s. And as, as progressive and active as North Omaha was athletically, it was just as active uh, and as spirited when it came to civil rights. And this is something that people really don't know for the most part even in Omaha, that North Omaha was uh, was was sort of like a civil rights oasis in the late 40s. They created uh, one of the one of the earliest civil rights organizations in the country. Came out of the neighborhood in 1947, 48, 49, uh, and it came from a black newspaper publisher named Mildred Brown, 
who I've seen her photos in the library. Uh, she is one of the only female newspaper publishers in the country, and she's running the Omaha Star on North 24th Street. And she teams up with a white uh, Creighton priest named Father John Marcou. Now, each of them have their own interesting stories. Mildred Brown is this, uh, this elegant woman who wears a white carnation wherever she goes and is very, very formal, rides in, the, rides in the back of a car. She has a driver everywhere she goes, but she's got that Josh Gibson tenacity, too, to the point where she'll threaten local businesses if they don't advertise in her, in her newspaper. We could really use her in the World Herald right now. Uh, but... Mildred Brown teams up with Father John Marcoux, who's, who's got this incredible story, too. He, he went to West Point with Dwight Eisenhower and was a football All-American. And uh, I think he was uh, like 88th in his graduating class, where Ike was somewhere in the top five. And so Father John Marcoux ends up down on the Mexican border uh, fighting, uh, fighting down there and is an alcoholic and lands in a Mexican jail cell, escapes from a Mexican jail, uh, sort of changes his life and devotes it to integration, goes to St. Louis University where they're not quite ready for his progressive ways, comes to Omaha where uh, he is he finds himself a half mile away from, from Mildred Brown's Omaha Star, and those two team up and they create something called the DePores Club. The DePores Club is, is this early civil rights organization. And the DePores Club in the 40s and early 50s, they start protesting and picketing and boycotting uh, sometimes it's a it's a it's an ice cream parlor. Sometimes it's Coca-Cola bottling company or a downtown restaurant. Their biggest target, though, was the city streetcar and bus company, which would not hire black drivers. And Mildred Brown and, and Father John Marcou they start they start uh, going after this uh, the streetcar and bus company that won't hire black drivers. And and they tell their their constituents that if you have to travel by streetcar or bus pay in pennies because they those drivers they hate that it's 18 cents if you got to pay pay in pennies guess who was doing that four years later in montgomery alabama during a bus boycott martin luther king jr that's not entirely a coincidence because martin luther king jr's wife and mildred brown were old friends again i wish i could ask what the how, how deep those connections go but north omaha is on the civil rights map and in the 50s, this is a place where things are really happening, where they're really pushing the envelope. At the same time that Josh Gibson is working, Mildred Brown is working. And these two currents are moving fast. And as we get you know, into the later 50s, we start to see this generation of young athletes growing up and sort of taking on a more prominent place, not only in the community, but also in the country. You know, Bob Gibson uh, is, is Creighton's top basketball player, and he'll join the Harlem Globetrotters before he gets into the St. Louis Cardinals. Bob Boozer becomes an All-American at Kansas State University and then wins an Olympic gold medal in 1960 with, uh, with, with what that was considered the, the best amateur basketball team of all time. Uh, so that things are really moving. Gail Sayers and his family move into the community, and Gail becomes the, the greatest long jump uh, jumper in the, in, the, in the country in 1961 at the same time that he's obviously a football phenom and he's committed to Nebraska and then he snubs them at the last minute because Nebraska is, is not very welcoming to black athletes and that's something that will basically uh, ruin Bill Jennings and inspire Bob Devaney to, uh, to change Nebraska's approach to black athletes especially in North Omaha. So things are really changing and as we get into the 60s, uh, you also start to see the emergence of new civil rights leaders, including a young Creighton educated uh, barber who's a little bit brash, very eloquent, wears, wears his t-shirts tight. He's a, he's a weightlifter before anybody was doing that. And of course, that was Ernie Chambers. Ernie Chambers emerges in the early 60s. And uh, they start targeting, he starts targeting the biggest issues in his community and in the city. And the, there, there are lots of things to choose from, whether it's police relations or um, education or employment. There are lots of civil rights sort of battlefronts, but the biggest one is housing. Housing is uh, it's something that, that literally segregates uh, North Omaha to this one square mile, and it's something that as progress happens on other fronts, 
the the thing that lags behind is is open housing and the question that really becomes a key issue in the 60s all across nebraska is do land landlords and uh do homeowners have the right to discriminate to who they sell or rent to it goes to the legislature in 63 and fails it goes to the legislature in 65 and fails and you start to see these paradoxes these incredible paradoxes that 50 years later almost don't seem possible but there these paradoxes are one of the big reasons uh, that Omaha and North Omaha eventually flares up in the late 60s. And I'll, let me give you an example. In 1964, October 1964, Bob Gibson beats the Yankees in Game 7 of the World Series. Okay, Maris, Mantle, the New York Yankees, right? You can't get any bigger than that. Bob Gibson beats the Yankees in Game 7. He comes home. He's a hero. He gets the parade through downtown Omaha, uh, the key to the city. I mean, everybody loves Bob Gibson. Two years later, he wants to move out to a West Omaha neighborhood, Rockbrook, and his neighbors try to run him out because they aren't ready for a black family in Rockbrook. In 1967, uh, one of the most interesting le legislative debates, I think, that has ever happened in Nebraska was the open housing debate in 1967. And um, it, was, it was voted down for the third time. It was voted down in 63, 65, and 67, which meant that homeowners and, and landlords had the right not to sell to black families if they didn't want to. The next day, Bob Boozer who had identified a housing lot in a Northwest Omaha neighborhood named Colonial Acres. He wanted to buy, he wanted to build a house in Colonial Acres. The day after open housing was voted down, Bob Boozer's developer called him and said, your neighbors, uh, they don't want a black family in the neighborhood. I can't go through with this sale. You're gonna have to find a house somewhere else. Bob Boozer was one of the 10 greatest players in the NBA at that time, but that just goes back to and drives home the point that for all the progress that happened uh, in civil rights, open housing was was the last sort of the last barrier. And th those flare ups, those paradoxes, those head scratching moments uh, really sort of pushed pushed North Omaha uh, to, to the edge in the late 60s. And in 66, the, there's three days of riots that, that break out when there's a police confrontation late at night on the 4th of July, and um, there's some words and back and forth, and the National Guard gets called in, and three days of riots break out, and buildings are burned on North 24th Street. And then in 68, in March of 68, presidential candidate, segregationist George Wallace comes to Omaha. Some of you probably remember this distinctly. And George Wallace comes to, to Omaha to try to get on the presidential ballot in Nebraska. And it happens at the Civic Auditorium, March 4th, 1968. And there are protesters all over the auditorium, all over, all over the streets outside. And according to the Nebraska governor, Wallace essentially creates a trap where he allows about 20 to 40 protesters to sit right in front of the stage. And he creates a clash with these protesters. Uh, and a melee breaks out in the Civic Auditorium a fight that spills out of the auditorium into the streets and again creates three days of riots in North Omaha. And in the midst of those riots, remember these intersection points that I was talking about, where the two currents start to intersect. Uh, one of the most interesting intersections happens where the best high school basketball player in the state, Dwayne Dillard, who's like a 1968 version of Kevin Garnett, uh, six foot eight, blocking eight to ten shots a game, just this incredible athlete. He gets picked up uh, two days before the 1968 state tournament. He gets picked up in a car where police find a, a Molotov cocktail, uh, and Dillard is uh, suspended from the first game of the 1968 state tournament. They move the tournament from Omaha to Lincoln, where it's been ever since, because they don't want to ha hold the state tournament in the same place where, uh, where this riot broke out two or three days earlier. And the night before the state tournament, Central High School's coach, uh, who's, who's absolutely in the, in the thick of this thing in terms of making the decisions, he looks out his window in a, in, in a Northwest Omaha neighborhood and he sees a burning cross in his front yard and thinks, 
you know, is this Omaha or is this Mississippi? There's a place that there's a there's a uh, an excerpt that I wanted you to read. This is from Wally Provost talking about Dwayne Dillard after he was arrested. Dillard was not just another boy in trouble, he was a symbol. To some people, he was an accused criminal who should be dealt with firmly and promptly. He symbolized all they feared from lawlessness. To another faction, he was a school athletic hero, perhaps even an idolized rebel. Considering the extreme emotions of the city, this was a hot one. Anyone touched it could expect to be burned. So Dillard becomes this sort of this representative of what's going on in North Omaha in, in, in the late 60s. And he plays in the semifinals, Central wins, he plays in the finals, and Northeast upsets Central to win the state championship. And it's just sort of one of these uh, gut punches that North Omaha had become very familiar with by the late 60s, whether it was injustice in housing or employment or education. Uh, there were just all these little things that, that just were gut punches. You know, one of them was uh, the, the freeway that Omaha built in the late 60s to run straight through the North Omaha neighborhood. This happened in cities across the country, but it was particularly devastating in North Omaha, where uh, the city ran a freeway right through the middle of the neighborhood because people who worked and lived in Florence and neighborhoods farther up north didn't want to have to drive down North 24th Street to get to downtown to work. So they built this freeway right through the middle of the neighborhood and, and really disjointed it. Uh, another even more important issue was those packing houses and the stockyards that I talked about and the importance of those economically to the black neighborhood. In the late 60s, those stockyards in a matter of about two or three years just collapsed. Uh, a lot of the trends that you see in, in meat packing today started in the late 60s where instead of farmers and ranchers bringing their cattle and hogs to South Omaha to one central market where they could sell uh, and where those the, that livestock would be butchered, suddenly these little satellite packing houses uh, started popping up along the countryside and it was more modern technology and it had a devastating impact on on the black neighborhood because those were the those were the best jobs those were good paying jobs and suddenly they disappeared very quickly and other industries in Omaha didn't hire uh, black workers at that time and if they did they certainly didn't pay them as well Kathy Hughes who's a central figure uh, in North Omaha compared it to a bomb going off when these when these, uh, when these stockyards jobs and these packing house jobs collapsed. And then of course, there's sort of the, there's just sort of the spiritual gut punches. And of course, maybe the, the most important was, was April 1968, one month after George Wallace shows up at the Civic Auditorium, Martin Luther King Jr. is shot and killed. And then two months later, Bobby Kennedy is shot and killed. And by the time we get into the fall of 68, by the time we get to that Sunday afternoon, October, October 6, 1968, when all these athletes are rising to the peak, uh, this world-class status, at that point, the neighborhood that produced them is a shell of itself. And there will be, uh, there will be uh, sporadic great athletes that come out of North Omaha in the 70s, 80s, 90s, but nothing like that network that rose out of the 50s and 60s. And it's in large part because what happened to the neighborhood. And it even happened to the Gibson family because Josh Gibson and Bob Gibson, as similar as they were, they butted heads like crazy. And they were stubborn and they, were, they both had chips on their shoulder. And by the late 60s, they were barely talking because Bob Gibson was one of the greatest pitchers in baseball. And he didn't need advice from his big brother. And yet Josh Gibson, uh, wanted to chime in. And Josh Gibson, who was such a, a, a huge mon monumental force in his community, sort of uh, recedes into the background. This, this coach who, who raised uh, Bob and Rodney Weed and Johnny Rogers and Roger Sayers, and they all played for him. In the early 60s, Johnny Rogers, uh, his baseball team, coached by Josh, they went down to South Omaha and they played in Brown Park and they lost and Josh made him walk home up North 24th Street, six miles. He was so upset by these kids losing, he said, just walk straight north, you'll make it home eventually. <laughs> okay, that's who Josh Gibson was. But by the 60s, by the late 60s, he's about 50 years old and he, he kind of steps away from coaching. 
And as we get into the 70s and 80s, uh, he's barely speaking to Bob. He doesn't go to his Hall of Fame ceremony. Um, and the Gibson family just kind of splinters. The biggest, the biggest gut punch, though, comes um, in June of 1969 when uh, a 14-year-old girl named Vivian Strong uh, is hanging out in the Logan Fontenelle Projects and a police call comes in that there's a burglary in the projects and she um, the police show up and she's a little scared and she runs out and runs down an alley and a police officer named James Loader follows her out uh, to the alley and raises his gun and fires and kills her from about 100 yards away and three more nights of the worst rioting uh, and really the last rioting that Omaha, North Omaha has experienced happened in June of 1969. And what was left of that wonderful neighborhood at that time uh, was really destroyed in the summer of 69. And there are remnants. I mean, Johnny Rogers comes up and wins a Heisman Trophy a couple years later and two national championships. But again, the place that created those athletes was never quite the same. So 24th and Glory is, is a story of, of incredible athletic triumph. Uh, it is also a story of, of devastating community destruction. And there are a lot of little lessons in it that people pick up on. I think one of the things that I pick up on is just the value of, of a community and what, what a community can do when it comes together and people are raising each other's children and people are looking out for each other. There's a place in, in North Omaha, it's still there to this day, Coons Park, Coons Park. Uh, Coons Park in the early 60s and late 50s on, on Saturday and Sunday afternoons just like this uh, would be this, this proving ground, this like magnet for great athletes in the neighborhood. And you could go up there on a Sunday afternoon and see future, uh, future all pros and future Hall of Famers and future NBA all-stars. And you could look around the park and, and see Marlon Briscoe and Bob Boozer and there's Johnny Rogers and Gail Sayers and Roger Sayers and they're all at Coons Park. And it's just amazing what this neighborhood produced. And yet it, it makes it sad uh, knowing that what was lost there too because an incredible neighborhood was lost. And so I, I want to leave you some time for questions or comments or criticisms, uh, but I'm, I'm very thankful for you to or thankful that you that you listened to that and uh, there's a lot more in the book but I tried to encapsulate it as best I could